Dudes and Dudettes, welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 166. I had to go back and look at my screen because I wasn't exactly sure what podcast episode this was. I'm not keeping good enough track. Anyway, welcome back to the show, podcast episode number 166. Glad you're here. I appreciate your time and attention as always. Today we are going to do something different, but I say that sometimes and then it's not all that different, but today it really is different. We have a guest on the podcast today, my friend Laura Cheadle, Laura Plank Cheadle, and for the first time in the seven-year like uh, history of this podcast, this is not specifically a discussion about anxiety or anxiety recovery. Yes, you heard me right, an anxiety podcast that is not talking specifically about anxiety or an anxiety recovery, but it is definitely related and applicable to the recovery process. Laura is a, has a very interesting story. She's a really great human being. She's got a lot to offer, and she is going to tell us a story about really being knocked on her rear end by life. Maybe not specifically about anxiety, by anxiety, but other issues, relationship issues and things of that nature. And the path she has taken since then to pick herself back up, dust herself back off and get back to a life that she is proud to live and happy to live right now. So sometimes we have to take our motivation wherever we can get it and our inspiration wherever we can get it. And sometimes it's good to put down the anxiety stuff for a little bit. And when I was introduced to Laura by a mutual friend and I heard her story, I said, ooh, this, this would be a good person for me to talk to on the air. So here we are. I think you're going to enjoy Laura's story. She's interesting. She's friendly. She's accessible. She's bubbly. She's very positive. And she lived through some really dark things. And the way she came out of it and the way she is kind of sharing that experience with others, to me, is just a lot of what the world needs. And I appreciate her. So you will hear Laura talk about, you know, going through some really dark times. You will hear Laura talk about having to pick herself up when she did not want to pick herself up. And more than anything else, you'll hear Laura talk about the way she incorporated trying new things, taking risks, being playful and willing to like kind of go out on a limb into her, what would for, be for us a recovery story for her, her getting her life back story. It's a good thing because there's direct parallels there, like trying things that you don't really want to try. You're afraid it's not going to work. You're afraid how it's going to feel when you do it. There you go. Like we're, she's talking our language just in a slightly different topic. So without further ado, I will get on to the interview. You guys are going to dig Laura, hopefully, like I did. And at the end, I will come back and give you all her links and everything like I usually do. Hope you guys enjoy it. I will see you at the end. All right, peeps. Here she is. The one, the only, Laura Cheadle. Laura, what up? <laughs> <laughs> the one, the only. I like that intro. So glad to be here, Drew. I'm going to build you up. Yeah, man, I'm going to hype this up. So as I mentioned in the intro, Laura is a bit of a departure from what you're used to hearing on the podcast, right? Because I, I and we'll get into this as we interview a little more. But what we're going to really talk about today is that story of going from absolutely shattered to back in the saddle and like actually doing life and clearly doing it well, at least that's what I think. So Laura came to me through a mutual acquaintance, Mia Voss, and uh, Mia has nothing but great things to say about Laura. And your story is so compelling to me that I think it could be very inspirational. So tell the people, tell the peeps, the, the audience here, a little bit about yourself. All righty. I uh, was a former corporate attorney, and I really felt like I had everything together. You know, as a perfectionist, I did everything possible to have the perfect career, the perfect family. I married the perfect man. I was the perfect. I really struggled hard to do that. Um to the point that I was definitely sacrificing myself. And then 23 years in to what I thought was this great life that I had built, I find out that my husband has cheated on me for 15 of those years with five different women. And the, the level the, the, the way I was shattered, I was gutted because it was everything. It was my life. I had all of my memories. Are they real? Are they not real? The way he acted, the way we talked to him, what, what's real and what's not real. It literally knocked me so far off my axis, my body confidence, my ability to be a wife, yeah. a mom, a lover, a house cleaner. I mean, like literally anything that I had ever done. Yeah. I thought, yeah, I, I didn't, my future was gone. My past was gone. My self-confidence was gone. My, you know, body shame. I mean, you name it, it brought everything up 
in literally a matter of moments. Yeah, I can imagine. That is like, you cannot get a clear example of, has the last 23 years actually been real? Who am I? What am I? What is this? Like right. I, you have the foundations just ripped right out from under you. Yeah. 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 And I think it's probably important to, to recognize in, in a situation like this, that it has nothing to do with the fact that your life was built on him, but you know, no. it is built on assumptions about a relationship and intimacy and trust and, and the things that you have built together. And that boom, that gets ripped out from under you. Yes. And I love that you said that because when I found out my youngest was about to go away to college and when I said earlier, you know, I'm sacrificing myself, I'm not doing that like in a martyr mode, like, Oh, I'm just such a hard worker. <laughs> I thought I was sacrificing for us, for the relationship. So my, for my family, I'm doing the right thing. And yay, now our youngest is going away. Now we can go into our life. Now I can get my career back. I thought we were a partnership. Yeah. Yeah. And as it turns out, not so much. That is incredible. I mean, I, I don't know how many years that has been uh, enough. But uh, holy cow, I can only say I'm sorry, because that's insane. Like 15 of the 23 insane. years. Yeah. So, you know, and I think people I know there are people listening that can relate to this exactly as it is, even though that's not necessarily what I'm usually addressing. But so now you find yourself completely in a situation where did you feel helpless? Like, uh, now can I even take care of myself? What can I even get out of bed? Yes, I was literally on the on the floor crying. And to make matters worse, one of my coping skills is movement is dance. Yeah. When I was finding out during disclosure, we got into a little altercation with his phone and my toe broke. So in the middle of all of that, I have a broken toe and I can't go outside and walk. I can't yeah. dance or work out or move. And I literally just laid there and cried because I couldn't get my head wrapped around anything. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Let, let, let's address the, the injury for a second here because we need to keep it in context. I yes. don't want anybody listening to do, oh, boo-hoo, she had a broken toe. Like, I no. can't even get no, out of no, bed because no. I'm agoraphobic. What we're looking for here is parallels. I mean, these were challenges. I want to talk about how Laura met these challenges. And we never right. compare one person's challenge to another. We know that. So, Thank you for that. And no, the fact that I couldn't walk doesn't really matter. And it's not that big of a deal. Well, what mattered it was does. as my coping skill, yes. my coping skill was movement. Yeah. My coping skill was getting out of nature. And when your go-to coping mechanism is taken away, yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. All right. Really universe. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Cause I don't have enough piled on me right now. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I Just get bring that. On. You know, and, and there are parallels because for a lot of people who are dealing with the, this anxiety disorders that I'm addressing all the time, they find themselves in these strained relationships, be they romantic relationships or family relationships or friendships. And those people in their lives become their coping foundation in a way. When I don't feel well, I go to my husband, I go to my girlfriend, I go to my partner, I go to my best friend. When those relationships either disappear or get weakened, their coping mechanism is taken away. So now, yeah. now you're literally hanging out there. You're flapping in the wind. So what happens? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a good question. What happens? Yeah. Um, it was, I had interesting self-talk moving between my head, like, what should I be doing? Okay, well, this coping mechanism is taken away. What can I do? You know, you're horrible. You're the worst human in the world. You deserve this. No, you don't deserve this at all. This is not you. This is him. These are his choices. These aren't you. And I would bounce back and forth. Yeah, and yeah. I felt crazy. I felt totally helpless, crazy, and overwhelmed because it's everything. Okay. Can I get a new job and start, you know, taking care of myself? Sure. Can I find a new place to live? Sure. Can I have a divorce? Sure. Can I figure this out? Sure. All at once? No. Yeah, that's a tough one. And I think that whole, you know, there's so much going on here. That whole situation, right, right exactly. Where now you have to, can I do these things? Can I, yes, I can. Yes, yes, you can do all those things. But in the end, the fact that you don't have anybody to rely on anymore. You have no backup. And everything that you thought you knew, you can't rely on anymore. So when you say, I feel like I'm crazy, I think that's a thing that a lot of people listening are going to resonate with, especially if they're coming from a traumatic or abusive background where they were almost taught over a long period of time. See, here's the interesting thing. For a lot of my listeners, they were taught over a long period of time that they're crazy that they can't yeah. trust themselves, that, you know, they're gaslighted, they're, they're, uh, you know, kind of manipulated emotionally and mentally. 
you had it happen. It clearly was going on. You just didn't know. It was boom. The switch got flipped instantaneously. Now you don't even know if you can trust your own thoughts, your own judgment, nope. your own anything. Nope. So how do you move forward when you're not even sure that you can trust what you know? Like how did I got fooled so easily? How the hell can I make good decisions here? That had to be part of it. Yeah. Oh, that was, that was a huge part of it because if I can't trust myself, how can I trust myself to go forward? How can I pick a good therapist? How can I know which friends are true? How, 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 how? Yeah. One of the best pieces of advice that I got is that you don't have to do this right now. Ooh. You do not have to make a decision whether you're going to stay married, whether you're going to get divorced, whether you're going to do couples therapy, individuals, you don't have to decide anything. Yeah. And that was kind of a turning point for me because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm like this go getter. I'm this perfectionist. I'm going to take care of things. And for somebody to say, uh, uh, yeah. you can muck around and you can sob and you can process and you can rage for as long as you need to. Was that, was that hard for you to actually buy into? Yeah. Perfectionism is a very common theme in, in, in the stuff that I talk about. Was it hard for you to abandon that? Because it's super hard for perfectionists, yes. first of all, to accept that as not a good thing. Because at some yes. point you get confronted with the idea that, oh, I thought that that was a badge of honor, but actually it's kind of killing me a little bit now. Right. right. So it, how hard was it for you to accept that, okay, I, I cannot solve this problem in its entirety instantaneously? It's going to happen in little tiny steps over a long period of time. And right now, if the best I could do is rock in the corner and cry for 10 minutes, that's what I'm going to have to do before I make lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Hard to and deal yes, with. That was very hard. Yeah. Yeah. So the disc what kind of discomfort does that bring about now? Now you cannot be the person corporate attorney, you know, oh. now in a completely different situation. Right? Yeah. A lot of discomfort and a lot of I knew that I needed to dig into myself. I knew not that I took blame for it. I right. did earlier on, <laughs> but not that I wanted to take the blame for it. But I also was curious about what my role in it was. Hmm. What unmet needs did I have? What, what in me that it allowed that? And there was again, that balance that it's not a blame, but what, what, why, could I not trust myself? Why could I not see that? Why could I not know? And there was a curiosity piece that did actually keep me moving forward too. And again, it's that, it's that fuzzy line because it's not that I'm blaming myself, but it's like, clearly there's some things about myself that I don't know. That's, this is fascinating. We could probably spend an hour just on this little sliver of thing that you just said right here. The propensity to when you see that, because now you're, you're forced, like a big light is shining on you. And it's like, okay, well, clearly I was doing some things. You weren't doing anything. His, what he did was completely his responsibility and not yours. Yes. But your willingness to understand, well, I, you know, what does this tell me about me? What can I learn about me? Often turns into just self-flagellation. Like I'm the worst. I'm a failure. I, clearly this was my fault. He, I, he couldn't love me, blah, 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 whatever it happens to be. That is such a razor's edge to stand on, though. Of yes. the self-awareness that, well, I might have things to work on now that doesn't involve just continually going back to, I'm the worst, I'm a failure, I'm the worst, I'm a failure. Like, the curiosity yeah. part, to me. Yeah. There's and I fell off that razor's edge. I mean, it's sure not like, yeah. I just stood there and said, oh my gosh, this is, no, no, yeah. no, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> I would tank, and I would climb back up, and I'd be like, but what about, and then I would tank, and then I'd climb back up, and yeah. I'd figure some things out. Let's talk about the climbing back up part, because for people listening who uh, now the, they're doing the hard work of trying to recover from these disorders, and it is hard work because they're intentionally doing really scary stuff every day, right? So everybody stumbles. It is so hard for some to, you know, you stumble and you wind up back in the hole a little bit, figuratively speaking, you got to claw yourself back up. How did you do that? On the days after you stumbled, and maybe you went into pity mode or beating yourself up mode, what was the key to turning that back around? The key for me was what kind of a person do, do I know myself to be? And what kind of a person do I want to end up? Because I knew some bitter old people, you know, yeah, I knew okay. some really bitter, grouchy, awful people who were just me and so filled with resentment. And he did this to me. And, and I kept thinking, I don't want, that doesn't feel good. Yeah. And my goal is to make myself feel better. Yeah. 
And does it feel good to hate on him and hate those women? And no. Or hate on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's like turning my life over to this. And I am not going to turn my life any over anymore. I gave 23 years and it's my life and it's my choice now. And I don't really care. And it was that fury sometimes and that anger and that determination that would literally help me climb back up because I was not going to give them the satisfaction. Well, I'd like you guys listening to really take a couple of seconds here and wherever you hear a reference to Laura's ex-husband, I want you to put your anxiety disorder in because you are, you are telling a parallel story, clearly different cir- circumstances, but I am not going to give my life to this thing. In your case, you know, a failed marriage that was based on infidelity and lies, in their case, this, this anxiety disorder that has been plaguing them for so long, I am not going to give the rest of my life to this thing. Fuel in the tank. Yes. Did it, did it light a fire when you needed it to? Huge fire. Yeah. Huge fire. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit. You have such an interesting story in terms of the things that you have done. Like, honestly, what made me, I I don't remember. I think it was, you reached out to me, me, it connected us and you're like, Hey, I'm an attorney turned burlesque dancer. And I'm like, how can I not talk to this woman? Who else has this story? (laughs) So how does that all fit into this? What, what did you build? I mean, is that something you were always doing? I started burlesque dancing when I was about 44. Disclosure of the infidelity was after that, about 10 years after. Okay. Now, I always danced growing up. When I said movement and walking was a coping mechanism, yeah. I crave movement. I love physical movement. Okay. I danced growing up. I've always worked out and taught fitness. I just love moving. Yeah. I'm a mover, you know? So when I was doing the mom thing and taking care of my family and sacrificing myself and being perfect. Yay. Rah, 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 rah. I really let my own needs go. I absolutely put myself on the back burner and I didn't do anything. Burlesque was a way that I reclaimed myself. All of a sudden I'm like, forget it. I love to dance. I deserve to spend money on dance classes. I deserve to take time away and I want to perform again. So I found burlesque. And I loved it because it's, it's a parody. It's humorous. It's ironic. And there is some stripping. It's never, ever, 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 ever nudity. Yeah. But it's the stripping away of the layers to show something that's underneath. And I was like, oh my gosh, amen to that. I mean, that's what I love. Strip away those masks, strip away the costumes. Yeah. What's yeah. the armor that you're wearing? Strip down and show it. So I'm doing burlesque and I'm loving it. And, you know, my husband's loving it. And this is this great hobby. And it was an interesting thing too, because then when I find out about the burlesque or the infidelity, Mm -hmm. then there's this judgment on burlesque that all of a sudden I think people are going to blame me. People are going to think she is this crazy stripper woman. And of course he left because she's probably doing it too, because that's so counterculture weird. And then that was like these other layers of shame. And it was like, wait a minute, the infidelity happened before I started. There isn't a relation, but how do you untangle all of that? Oh, boy. Yeah, that's so good because so many times things do get tangled up. It is possible to have more than one problem at the same time. They might coexist, but they are not related. And you had you had that. Right. Yes, you had that. So yeah. that whole thing. So now you're dancing for 10 years before things, the wheels fall off on you. Yes. But you're also coming from like, you know, the life of the corporate life. You know, you clearly went to law school, you earned your stripes, you were doing that whole thing. How did that fit in? I, I you know, I, I was so curious. Did it? Um, did people it, know? It did you have to kind of like, I'm gonna put myself out there and own this? You seem like the type of person that would pretty much throw a middle finger to the world if they don't like it. But maybe you weren't always I don't know. I, you know, yes and no. There are some people I'm willing to throw the middle finger finger to, yeah. but I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to hurt my kids. Yeah. I don't want to completely cause my family to become unhinged. Right. Um. So I was I was cautious with this. I would t- I was tentative with it, and I really had to kind of explore some of the patriarchy stereotypes. Why can't a woman be smart and sexy? Yeah. Why can't she be spiritual and sexy? And the more 
it, it, everything is burlesque. Life is burlesque. And that's the whole ironic part about it. I can be a brilliant corporate attorney and I can strip down and be really sexy and I can get on my knees and be very spiritual and I can be a good mom. Why can't I? Right, right. All of those if things. You, yeah. If you don't think I can be, it's your problem, not mine. Yeah, sure. That makes perfect sense. I, I like the confidence story here. Although clearly you had to have some confidence going into this naturally. I mean, you're not going to get where you are without it. But it sounds like a whole other, this is a whole nother layer, you know, love the whole nother. It's a whole nother layer of confidence that's probably more deeply rooted than just the typical like, yes, overachieving career woman, mom with everything. There's confidence there, but this sounds deeper. There, there's, yes, there's confidence there. Um, there's also a lot of passion there that okay. I can be who I am and you cannot tell me who and how I can be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, and on the mirror side of that though, there is a deep, deep, deep desire to please. There is a deep, deep, deep desire. I, I knew you're going to get there. I knew you're going to, I knew you're going to go there. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. To not be wrong to please. Okay. Okay. Yes. I don't want to feel that. Yes. I mean, nobody does, but I'm, I'm an only child. And as an only child, you please people. Yeah. So does that lead to because perfectionism and people pleasing, these are all for the, the uh, my audience has heard this stuff over and over. And over. These are GAD drivers, generalized anxiety disorder drivers in a big way, and they underlie a lot of these disorders, right? So part of the part and parcel of that is being able to let go of some of these things. Maybe I'm not a perfectionist. Maybe I'm not going to please everybody all the time, which is really hard because it's a bit of a threat to your identity. Did you did you have to work through that? Like, what if I'm not the perfect person? Yes, yes. And I worked through a lot of it. It sounds funny, but on stage in burlesque, huh. stripping out of that perfection literally and physically yeah yeah look at look at what this course it does to my body guess what i've had two babies and i've nursed for two years my body's not that way again want to see it ha ha yeah yeah right <laughs> jokes on everybody yeah 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 that that's a tremendous look that sounds terrifying just like yes. yeah terrifying and liberating at the same time and i think so much of the the journey that people listening are going through is that these are terrifying things. These are different things. These are things you'd prefer probably not to do if you didn't have to. But there's also liberation on the other side of those things. Yes. And what I have found, every single time I lean into something that I'm terrified of, yeah. the fear of that thing is greater than the experience of actually doing that thing. Yeah. The fear is greater than the experience. Meaning. Yes. Yeah. In, in the beginning. Yes. Yeah. And if you can just kind of, if you listen, that's the secret sauce is always, if you could just kind of go through the fear, you know, as if it's easy, it's not uh -huh. easy. The uh -huh. reward at the end is so much greater. Like you, you, did you ever look back and say, wow, that was cr all the stuff you've been through. Like that was, I f it felt impossible, but maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Right. And this was an experience too. And again, this came from dance and the lessons that I learned, you know, on the burlesque stage translate so well to life. Yeah. Okay, is it terrifying enough getting up on stage at 44, you know, having a mom body and dancing? Again, you're not totally naked, but you're showing your belly. Who wants to do that? You not know, me. nobody. Yeah, <laughs> okay. nobody. Yeah. Nobody does. So you do it, and then you get this response from people. Thank you for doing that. Ooh. You have shown me I can be free. I would get women coming up to me after performances all the time saying, I can be beautiful now. Oh. You sh and you're like, oh. Ooh, happy unintended side effect right there. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, And then it bolsters you. Right. Oh, 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 oh. And then you just, you, you do start putting yourself out there more. And have I failed? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the coolest things, and, and we'll kind of start to get toward, you know, where you are now and what you're doing. And I, this is where the, the plot twist will come in. Because I know people listening don't know who you are. And they have not, probably have not seen you. And they're, when they find out what you do, they're going to be like, how did she sneak on? Because, <laughs> but you'll notice, look at the parallels here. I and mean, here's the part that I kind of dig. What I see you, at least what I know of you, and I can only tell what I know of you on social media, you're so willing to be silly. You're so willing to let your guard down. And you seem so, and, and you seem so willing to have different experiences and try different things. But more than anything else, 
you you hold yourself not to say you hold yourself up, but you hold yourself out there as an example for other people. Other you seem to be speaking to other women, which is fine if that's your f- focus. Nothing wrong with that. You can be silly too. It's okay to let your guard down. It's okay to let it all hang out. It's okay to try different things. That is what I dig, and the way you seem to be delivering that message looks so different than the ten thousand other people who are doing what you're doing. So I want to give you credit for that. For that. Thank you for that. Yes. That means a lot. So how did you turn this into what you are doing these days? And I like the term life choreographer. <laughs> Hang you. in there, folks. Don't get the pitchforks and torches. Let's just listen to Laura here. <laughs> <laughs> so much is born from your own pain, yeah. you know, from your own identity. Because as I'm going through this experience, I'm needing so much. I'm needing some therapy. I may be needing some coaching. I'm needing some books. I'm needing some spiritual stuff, but I'm needing some movement too, because that's who I am. And I just kind of backstepped into it. I needed this holistic type of thing that wasn't out there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I like how you say things silly because that's what a lot of it is for me is trying some things out. You know, it's not like your typical coaching relationship. It's not like, I'm just going to teach it a dance step and it will all be great. Yeah. It's let's get really messy and let's strip down. I mean, that's my big thing. It's stripping down. Let's strip down. What are you afraid of? What is the mask that you're wearing? What's underneath that mask? You don't know. I didn't know either yeah. until it was ripped away from me. I didn't know who I was and let's play. Yeah. Yeah. Let's play. That's what I really like. You do seem to make it very playful and safe. In a way, it's like, hey, let's let's try some crazy stuff here in a safe environment. And trying crazy stuff is a great way to maybe break some of those old barriers and bonds of like, I'm not capable, I need to be under wraps, I don't want people to see me, I have to make sure I'm taking care of everybody else except for me. How, how did you, because this is so strange in a way, you go yeah. from like, I'm living for everybody else to living for yourself to a certain extent. Now, clearly still concerned about your family and your and your kids and stuff, But a lot of people struggle with that. Did you struggle with that? Like, am I being selfish? This is selfish, isn't it? I'm not supposed, I'm not entitled to this. Yes. Yeah. Heck yes. And the way other people say things like too, oh, what are your kids going to think? Well, wait, you're spending evenings away from your kids. What are they going to do for dinner? Yeah. Yeah. There is very little support in our society for taking care of ourselves. I've seen your pictures of your kids. They ate. Yeah, yes. they Congratulations, <laughs> Laura's kid. They survived. So it worked out. Um, <laughs> this is great. So what are you doing with yourself now? So what, what is what is a life choreographer? And what are you up to? Yeah, oh, thank you. I work with people who've been betrayed. And betrayal is a huge thing, yeah. whether it's yeah. betrayed by your body in terms of like menopause or a disease where you're relying on something and all of a sudden, whoop, the rugs ripped out from the, under you. Yeah. So it's betrayed by life, your body or by somebody you love. And what I really help people do is flourish. What does flourish mean to you? It, mo- it means something so different from me than from you, from, from anybody else. Yeah. But it's getting clear on what kind of a life do you want to live? How do you want to be? How do you want to show up? Do you want, like, I want to be playful and fun and flirty. Flirty is my energy. Yeah. How do you want to be? Most people don't know how they want to be. Most people are fighting, you know, like that, an anxiety disorder, fighting with the spouse, fighting with kids, fighting with the job. And they all know all of the stuff that they don't want. Yeah. But what do they want? And that's what a life choreographer does. What do you want? Let's play. Let's experiment. Is it dancing? Nope. Is it soccer? Nope. Is it art? Nope. Let's play. Is it guitars? Right. Let's play. Who knows? Let's figure it out. Yeah. And I think I love the idea that you have actually put, because there's about a zillion places out there. Oh, are those your wind chimes? No. Oh, that's my alarm. Duh. Never mind. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I, you know, well, I help. Look, that, that, we hear that every day. I, I help women flourish. I help people 10X and, uh, and flourish. But I like the idea that you are literally holding up a model of action, activity, that says doing, because we talk all the time in the podcast, but d- this is a doing solution. And, you know, so maybe yours is focused on movement and dance and that sort of experimentation. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to wind up being a burlesque dancer or even a yoga oh. guru. But it's a way to just break out of the routine and the ordinary and start to at least experience different things and and questioning yourself and challenging yourself and allowing new experiences to come in. And I think that leads to flourishing in the end. 
Yes, it does. Just this weekend, I was working with a woman and we did this little dance move where you just cross your legs and put your hands on your knees. Yeah. And I was like, well, what came up with you? Your, your face shifted. And she's like, my hand on my knee just brought in all these sensations and oh my gosh. And, and it kind of felt good. And then should it feel good? And is that, and like that, let's, yeah. let's see what comes up. Who knows? Like in having <laughs> oh. the bravery to just experience different things, different feedback, different sensory, different kinetic experiences and the reactions that you have yourself and other people have to those things. There's a tremendous, that's, that's flexing your bravery muscle right there. Yeah, it is. And then I asked her to take her arms up and be like, ooh, and she's like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. She's like, it makes me mad that you ask that. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> then let's let's talk about that. Is that an expression thing? You know, right. is it fear around there? I mean, again, it's it's digging deep. What is the pain point? Where how, Do you want to be able to do this? Do you not want to be able to do it? Yeah. Where do you want to be? How do you want to live your life? But nothing else. It was the experience of, of you asking that person to do that. And then they oh. got to experience their reaction, which they might not have even known was going to happen. But that's, yep. a, that's a learning moment. That's a classroom moment right there. So, totally. yeah, you got good stuff going on. I, I kind of dig it. So where can, we're, we're about 28 minutes, so we'll wrap it up here. So if people want to find you, and I'll put all the links, by the way. I don't know what podcast episode this is going to be, so keep listening after and I'll tell everybody. Um, you can go to theanxioustruth.com slash whatever and I'll have all Laura's links. But how can people find you online, Laura, if they want to learn more They can you. find me across all social media, Laura Cheadle. Um, yeah. They can also find me at my website, laurachedle.com. And that is L-O-R-A. Yeah. Uh, Cheadle is C-H-E-A-D-L-E, right? Yes. yes. And I also have um, a betrayal recovery guide at nakedselfworth.com. Yeah. Because I talk a lot about naked self-worth, just who are you naked? Who are you stripped down? Yeah. Who are you underneath? Super the anxiety, yeah. the trauma. Yeah. <laughs> Who yeah. are you? All of those things. I, and I appreciate you. I, I do appreciate the message and the, I don't know, you just, you just seem like such a safe person to explore with. Thank you. And maybe you are, maybe you're not. I could be wrong, but you appear to be that, <laughs> which I, I do appreciate. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to think I am. Yeah. So thank you. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very non judgmental and willing to let people just be silly and play and explore. And that's kind of cool. And, it, you know, if, you, if that sounds like something that you guys would be interested, just go follow Laura, even if there's, you know, there's not a whole lot for sale there, but she's just a cool person to know. So do it. <laughs> anyway, Laura, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Yeah, we're gonna do it again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. All right. See you guys in a bit. I'll be back in a second. All righty, then I hope you guys enjoyed that. Here we are back in the studio. I love to say back in the studio it means nothing. Anyway, I really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you did too. I hope you got some things out of it. Laura's lessons that she learned that she's passing on to people really are applicable in recovery. They really are. And it was nice to have somebody give us a different view of those kind of lessons coming from slightly different experience and, and applying it a little bit differently. But Laura's willingness to encourage people to get out there and do things that make them uncomfortable and take risks and fail if you must pick yourself back up. I love that message. I really do. So this was a great episode for me to do. I enjoyed it. Again, I hope you guys did too. Hope you got something out of it. If you would like to find Laura, you can find her at Laura Cheadle, L-O-R-A. Cheadle is C-H-E-A-D-L-E.com. But you can also go to the anxious truth.com slash 166. For the show notes for this episode, I will have all Laura's links, her website, her social media and everything right there. And before signing off, I'm going to ask you the same favor that I always do. If you're watching, if you're listening to the podcast on iTunes or some platform that lets you leave a rating or a review, then leave a rating. Five stars would be awesome. Whatever the highest is, take another minute or so, maybe write the podcast a little review if you're digging it, because good reviews help other people find the podcast. And that's why I spend the time that I do to try and spread this around and help as many people as I can. So I would greatly appreciate it if you did that for me. And I do appreciate the time and attention you guys give me week in and week out. It's overwhelming. I did not ever think that it would turn into this, but it has. And, and I appreciate you guys for that. So as always, I'll play you out with Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. Go check him out. Ben, thank you as always for letting me use Afterglow. I will see you guys in the next episode. And remember, this is the way. No looking back or dwelling on the past You know you'll never get another chance So go and live your life